This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Hey there, Thunder Buddies and Travelers Down Thunder Road. It's us, Days of Thunder, the WCW Thunder Rewatch podcast that you didn't ask for, but we did anyway. Coming to you as part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. I'm your host, your fiancé upon Thunder Road, Dave Ryan. And I am joined as I am every week by my faithful co-hosts, Stagger Lee Malone. Lee, how are you? I'm good. Congratulations. Thanks, man. <laughs> it's uh, quite a momentous moment. Yeah, I popped the question this past week in, in Prague to my, my significant no, other, no, no, Emma. No, 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 I'm talking about we, we got to Spring Stampede 99. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. How dare I be so selfish? <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, I'm saying congrats yeah. on the engagement. Thanks, buddy, thanks. Uh, yeah, it was a real, um, it was great, you know. Um, I'm not going to bore everyone with the details, but uh, Prague is our, our favourite city. I'm going to live there for a year. Um, thought it was the perfect place to to pop the question, uh, and yeah, she said yes, which I think was the bit I was least nervous about. I don't know if you were um, the same with your wife, but that was like the part about the whole process I was least concerned about. I was more like, eh, am I going to? Because we were doing it like I was doing it at like the tip of an island, so I had things like, is the weather going to be shite? Uh, when I go down on one knee, is my notoriously dodgy knee going to lock? And then I have to sell the knee. Uh, <laughs> am I going to like, uh, is the knee going to seize up? And then I end up rolling into the water in the middle of the, the, the river in Prague. R- R- Ralph uh, Wiggum style, just rolling down the hill. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was like, um, weirdly, I've been on this island every time we've been to Prague. And... Um, there's usually like swans and fish around and it's lovely and for the first time in my life i saw what i'm pretty sure were beavers on this island this time it's like so i i had this like very slapstick image of a rogue beaver coming and somehow getting the ring box out of my shorts or knocking it out of my hand or some shit does, does, um, does the beaver signify something in like horse I- horoscopal signs or I don't no, I, know. like is it some sort of weird tea leaf yeah. thing um I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, yeah, no, it went well. Um, and yeah, we're kind of, I'm still in that weird space where like, it was like a surreal couple of days, you know, like mm. calling family, celebrating while we're still there. And now we're back home since day before yesterday, but I'm still on holidays from work. And so like, I have no concept of day or time. And I think only when you text me last night about uh, how far are you into Spring Stampede? And I was in my head for a second. Spring Stampede? What the fuck? (laughs) It's like, oh yeah, it's Monday. We're doing this show tomorrow night. Fuck. Um, Yeah, so it's been, yeah, it's been a powerful good weekend. Uh, Big old smile on my face. Sounds, sounds like you e- had a great time. Yeah, which even World Championship Wrestling can't rub off my face this week. Although they will try, my friend. They will try. Um, how have you been? I mean, other than putting out my back at some stage late last week. Yeah. Speaking of, like, great selling. And old uh, man problems. I've just been li- living the dream, Dave. Living the dream. While you're off gallivanting with all that Patreon money. I've mm. been uh, at home diligently working. Yeah. Between, like, your new um, bad back and my old bad knee, uh, we could probably funnel that sweet Patreon cash into, like, getting a live-in carer for the two of us. (laughs) I was going to say, we could probably uh, work it into, like, a tag run somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> oh my god, we would be such sympathetic faces in the the, the southern territories. Oh, I tell you, the the back would be taped up longer than DDP's ribs. You can do like your redeemer esque style promos about having like a back made of sand. Uh, <laughs> why did your god curse you and shit like that? And you and your glass knee. Yeah, I can I can just do the you know do the spot where like I I I try to like do a running move or try to do a suplex and the knee just kind of gives out at the at the last second. I was who oh who was he against? I was watching a Razor Ramon match the other day where they were working the knee as part of the match, um, and he does the bit where he goes up for the Razor's Edge and he does the most like dramatic Scott Hall. Oh, my knee has to turned to liquid. <laughs> um, I can't remember if it was Bret Hart. I'll, I'm going to have to look it up and see who it was against while we're talking. Mm. Um, but oh, so another thing I did this week is that I watched. Um, I watched something that I think um is a, a, a property, a series that kind of has long gone hand in hand with my love of professional wrestling, and I think is maybe. Um, consistently booked better than professional wrestling, and that is, I went to the cinema today to see the the new Dragon Ball Z movie to oh, try and okay. get myself a little blast from the the past. Uh, were you a Dragon Ball guy growing up? I know you're a couple no, of years older than me. The, the, the yeah. whole anime thing came right at the end of my kind of yeah. childhood years. You would have been like mid adolescence, maybe, because I know I was right at the end of primary school when they started showing DBZ over here. Yes, yeah, so Pokemon came along right as I was at that borderline age. <laughs> oh man, you were aging out with some good shit. And then everything came in after that. So yeah, if I was going to so, get into Pokemon, it would have been real early, and I just never did. So, um, kind of, it's actually funny because Cartoon Network is responsible for a lot of my my passions, and one of them is, you know, the, we talked about it on maybe the first episode of this show where Cartoon Network used to change in TNT mm-hmm. at 9 p.m., and that's how over here for a long time we saw Nitro and Thunder. Yep. Um, but also, f- from about the year 2000, uh, the version of Cartoon Network we got in the UK and Ireland around four or five o'clock because it was like a little while after i got home from from school would turn into a block of anime yes um called toonami i was just gonna say it was toonami wasn't it yeah yeah and that had like um sailor moon was on there apparently do not remember that mobile mobile suit gundam was on there for sure um which i think was maybe i think if you had caught mobile suit gundam at that like the age you were mm. when I saw that, that probably would have been your thing because it was like a little bit pitched older yeah, than yeah. where I was at the time. And then Dragon Ball Z. Also, weirdly, it was it was a Western animation, but it was kind of like with a lot of Eastern culture in there. Samurai Jack was in that block as well, which like whips ass. But anyway, um, Dragon Ball Z, I became utterly, utterly obsessed with. I have watched every episode of it like several times over i'm not a big anime guy there's the occasional thing that i will get into or watch for a little while nothing ever hit for me like um dragon ball z did Mm. um now i will say if i had seen it at the time i would probably be a really annoying one piece fan because i have i've tried to watch that a couple of times lately and it seems really up my street but the problem with one piece is um one uh, the manga is still being made, so they haven't run out of episodes yet. Okay. And they are already on, I think, is it nearly a thousand issues of the manga, nearly 800 episodes of TV? Oh, fuck. So to try and catch up on that is just not a thing that's going to happen for me realistically at, in my 30s. Um, but yes, yeah, so as I say, DBZ was great, and it kind of like, it, it felt like a kind of... I was really into wrestling and, you know, this is all about combat and fighting and, you know, who is the strongest warrior and the idea of like, um, learning through perseverance and strength and and things like that. Um, um, so yeah, I had a real soft spot for it. Um, it kind of, 
I, I, I'm not really spoiling things for, for people who have seen it, but it took a dive off a cliff when it turned into Dragon Ball GT. And then a couple of years ago, a new series called Dragon Ball Super started. And it, thus the snowball effect of it getting popular all over again in the West started. It seems to be getting like a bit more uh, praise yeah, than its predecessor. You see a lot of uh, DBZ stuff around at the moment. Mm. Yeah, so I and, and we're, I think it has picked up some more popularity. We're we're also in an age with things like Crunchyroll and Funimation apps and things like that. That this stuff is way more accessible now. So there's a new generation of people that are finding this shit. And I don't know, you've probably seen this as well, Lee, with some stuff. I know I can't move on Twitter at the moment from like Gen Z people discovering Breaking Bad now. Yeah, apparently that's a thing now. Yeah, yeah, that's there's loads of people discovering that. Is, like, there's just people, because there's now a generation that saw Better Call Saul first. I hope not, because Jesus, that show does not work as well if you haven't seen Breaking Bad first. Okay, um, uh, it's a great show, but again, you gotta. Again, I'm not a Breaking Bad guy, so. <sighs> so I would look. That's I'm not. I'm not getting into that. I'm not gonna become that annoying guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So anyway, I I just thought on a whim as like I you know I love going to cinema. Lee, we've talked about you it do? before. I was like, oh, what's on this morning? Because I've got thunder tonight, so I don't want to go tonight. And what was on at 11.45 this morning, but Dragon Ball Super Superhero. Um, and being that schools were just back, I'm assuming that you had that, that whole cinema to yourself. There was one other person. <laughs> that was it. We were sitting miles away from each other. I was just going to say, and we were sitting right next to each other. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, it was great. And it was just a nice little, I think my, my day is very 90s themed now because I got to jump back in time with that. I thought it was a very entertaining movie. Um, and it was one of the, because I've seen a, a good few of those Dragon Ball films and some of them are really kind of like take them or leave them. I watched Battle of the Gods a few years ago. Didn't think that was great. Watched Broly in 2018. That was much better. And this is kind of like a direct sequel in some ways to that. Okay. Um, really, really liked it. But also what's really good about the Dragon Ball films whenever they come around is that I think if you're a parent bringing a kid to a Dragon Ball film and you don't have a fucking clue, it's pretty good at like establishing and doing Basil Exposition stuff at the start so that you're kind of, even if you're not super into the minutia, that you're aware of what the stakes are and who the, the main people are. So they, um, they have their version of Michael Cole explaining everybody who everybody is as they come on screen. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of because it's like, you know, fairly roughly translated in some cases in the dub, um, there's like, there's literal lines where it's like, oh yeah, I forgot I can do that since this thing happened on this planet. <laughs> like, it's really like, we just need to get the exposition out of the way in this line. But uh, no, it was good fun and it's it's left me like pretty jazzed for oh, this. Um, Lee. Dave. Um, we are doing some stuff over on the Patreon. Um, we have done some stuff this month. I think it was a good month. Uh, I'm really happy with the stuff we've done this month, and I'm really excited about what's coming up next month. Uh, hit everybody with what they can expect from patreon.com slash WCWThunderPod. So, in the month of August, we had, what, five or six? Was it six different episodes we've put up? This No, we had the two. We had the two. The, the, um, I think this is this is. Or sorry, just... four. It's four. It's four separate shows we've put up. Yeah. Um, four Patreon exclusive shows we've four. had in the month of August. Yeah. We have your. Um, God, why can't I talk today? Uh -huh. <laughs> your match uh, guides. Yes. So we we've had, uh, we've we're we've four shows, four shows and then yes. a couple more posts as well. So yes. we had the sheet the in sheet. the middle of the month. That's the word I was stretching for. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So we have your sheet that's gone up. That has gone up, has it? Uh, it has. The sheet went up about a week. Uh, yeah, before you went on holidays, yeah. Yeah. Um, we obviously had a rehash at the start of the month. We had a first episode of Black and Golden Days, which has got great reviews. Um, mm -hmm. We had my Q&A that I've put up. You will have your grab bag radio. By the time this airs, it will but already yeah, be up. It will already have gone up. That's why I'm saying we've had four. <laughs> and... Mm -hmm. hey. um, Obviously, in September, we have big plans because, as we revealed earlier on today, Tuesday, we are going to do, or attempt to do, our first Patreon-exclusive live stream 
about we're saying about an hour before the buy-in begins yeah. on Sunday we, we, before all out. We will post details uh, behind the the paywall for all patrons. Mm-hmm. Um, we will obviously have. We also said we will have a poll going up to mm-hmm. decide what our second show will be in the month of September. Yeah, so we've been kind of doing one rehash and one other show mm-hmm. uh, every month so far, but we decided because we're kicking off the month instead of with rehash, we're kicking off with something else. We said, let's let's have that rotating second slot be decided by the listeners. So we're going to put up all our limited run series for a vote. Uh, which one do you want to see the next episode of? Um, and that is going to also be live by the time this podcast airs, mm-hmm. but it will stay up for a week before we kind of make the final judgment. So I think we, we've we said that the four show will be at, at Draft and Drafts 2. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I think being that, you know, we, we are doing the live stream for the pre-buy-in, we should, I think I'll, I'll reveal that the Draft and Drafts will be a AEW-related draft mm-hmm. so it's kind of tying into the whole week and all that's going on yeah um we will also have a guest on that show yes so it won't just be the two of us there will actually be three of us drafting yeah it's not just AEW that can have a, a mystery main event <laughs> um and yeah so of course in september we'll also have dave will have a grab bag i may do another solo audio I might get start uh, trying to do these regularly, kind of improve myself, while also, you know, getting feedback, because who doesn't love getting feedback? Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, no, we're, we're really happy with how things are going on the Patreon the last couple of months. Yeah. And most of all, we hope people are enjoying it as well. Yeah, this will, and you know, I, I feel like the more we get into it, the more often I, I say it, but I, I think in terms of like, even if you want to take out that I, I do think we're getting better at the shows we're putting Mm -hmm. behind the paywall as time goes on. Even beside that, like in terms of amount of content, September is going to be our our biggest month yet. So it's probably the best month so far to, uh, to give us a try and to stick around if you're already here as well. Um, So that's patreon.com slash WCW thunder pod. Now, Lee, this show it's going to be the last great WCW pay-per-view I've heard. But uh, before we get into that, let's go over and get our bills paid and talk to our sponsors. That's right, Days of Thunder listeners. It's that time again. If you have an appetite like the corn-fed meathead Skip Sheffield, you're going to want to listen into this because we got to talk about our friends at HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Choose from 55-plus weekly options featuring pre-portioned, high-quality ingredients picked at peak ripeness. HelloFresh delivers fresh, quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week, so you can savour summer flavours right from home. Select meals from the Taste of Summer series that are sure to become everyone's new favourites, like the Old Bay Shrimp and Sausage Boil and family-style grilled steak lettuce wraps. Holy hell. To avail of the offer that's being made to you, the Days of Thunder listener, all you gotta do is go to hellofresh.com slash VOW16 and use the code VOW16 for up to 16 free meals across 7 boxes and 3 free gifts. One more time, that's hellofresh.com slash VOW16 and use the code VOW16 at checkout to avail of that offer. And if that doesn't sate your appetite, I just don't know what will. It's HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Back to the show. This is Spring Stampede 1999, dated 11th of April 1999, uh, from the Tacoma Dome in Tacoma, Washington, getting a 0.6 buy rate. Um, and we start the show with the swooshy WCW logo ident. The space splatter logo, as I like to call it. It was... Uh, that, I love that. For... <laughs> for <laughs> for better or worse because ultimately it becomes a harbinger of you're about to have two to three hours of unmerciful shit thrown at you um just that sound effect uh hit the dopamine receptors a little bit for me i gotta say i, 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 was say, I got it. a bit nostalgic watching it 
<laughs> yeah. Um, such a weird thing to be nostalgic for. And then we get a hard rocking video package. Um, and I will say this video package, uh, I think all the video packages actually tonight were pretty damn good. Mm. Um, and all the recaps were pretty damn good. Um, and this one made this main event feel like a much bigger deal than the actual TV had made it yeah. look like. Um, because I don't know about you, we didn't really talk about it as much on the go home show, but I feel like this, this four way plus special guest referee thing Again, it's a case of, I feel, overbooked, and it feels like, in terms of what they are putting across on TV, it's like, we're continuing the Flair and Hogan thing, plus three more guys. Yeah, it's like, overbooked, but underprepped, if that makes sense. Um, A lot of it feels... Overbooked overbooked and undercooked. Yes, and a lot of it just feels kind of thrown, like you said, they're continuing the Flair and Hogan thing, but here's more Mm. people. Um, Yeah. I will say, I do think... In spite of only having six days built, Nash and Goldberg does feel fucking big. As, as a semi, as a semi main, like. And again, this video package they should have fucking shown it on Thunder because it makes the four way look like one. It was the plan all along, mm-hmm. <laughs> and two, like you know, you can't wait to see these guys get their hands on each other. Um, Tony says springtime is upon us. Um, I love the uh, the Chiron at the bottom of the screen that has like a revolver shooting out the Tacoma, Washington that then gets kicked by a cowboy boot. Um, in something that was kind of a surprise to me, uh, Tony says this is the first WCW pay-per-view coming from the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. I suppose it's not a place that WCW and WWF would regularly visit all that much because like Portland was its own territory well into the mid-90s. Yeah, uh, and I remember reading the figure four and listening to like early podcasts in, of um, Brian Alvarez in the 2000s talking about how it would be like you would get just house shows and the mm. occasional Raw yeah. and stuff like that. And really until um, Mania ran Seattle um, in Safeco Field that uh, it was... And, and like, even since then, I don't think they've had like a major show. Not that, not that not, comes not, off the top of my st- mind. Sticks out, yeah. Mm. Um, it's again, it's mainly like TV will come from there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like the famous um, one of the early Raw hijacks for Daniel Bryan was in Washington, Washington, wasn't Washington, it? Yeah, the, yeah. the one where they were trying to have the putting the two belts on the hook ceremony oh, and yeah, people kept chatting before the TLC match yeah and yeah and Punk was pissing himself laughing Jesus, yeah. the most checked out man on earth that was when when Mark Henry had to grab that uh, Danielson's arm and like lift it up for the crowd to cheer yeah yeah um so we we get and this is something I really love about this show the the structure of this show Lee thick and fast Match, match, video package, match, match. <laughs> like, you know, it was no messing about. They wanted to hit what they wanted to hit tonight, and it all fucking, it all came off, really. And do you know what? It's it's so weird that uh, so early in the show, I get to kick back and have a break, but as has become tradition <laughs> now, when the man himself, Blitzkrieg, is in town, uh, Lee Malone takes over the show. So our, our opening singles contest... Is Blitzkrieg versus versus Juventud Guerrera in a match that Lee, you've been chomping at the bit to talk about for literal months now. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've talked about it on this show before, but Spring Stampede is a VHS that I owned, and Blitzkrieg, like this, was the match that really got me on to like the Blitzkrieg train and really made him stick in my mind. Um, I mean, you want to talk about classic pay-per-view openers. This is right there for mm. me. It's not... It's, forget fucking star ratings. I don't care about them. This is just a match that is ingrained in my memory. I, um, I'll be having to... I'm going to be dragging one day David Meltzer through the mud tonight a couple of times, possibly. I, um, I can only imagine the star ratings he's given. Because yeah. he, he... You want to talk about a guy that just didn't enjoy this era of wrestling. Yeah. There, there is like one or two matches where I think Dave is out to lunch on this show, and there's one or two where I'm starting to think maybe I'm out to lunch. <laughs> but we'll we'll talk about that as we go on. Um, 
So the first thing to note is Blitzkrieg has a few enhancements to his mask tonight. Mm-hmm. He has some kind of new black mesh effects on the eyes and the mouth, I think. Yeah. Um, again, just a slight improvement to his overall look. It really helps he doesn't look as shindy. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd love that. Uh, I think it's Tony mentions that Super Calo actually got a second degree concussion from the Sky Twister press on Thunder. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, that's possibly saying Blitzkrieg is dangerous, but when you're a fucking a teenager, you're like, fuck yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I just love, like, they just go for in this match. They are just go, mm-hmm. go, go. Again, there's no, like, you, you, you people talk about storytelling and wrestling. The, the story is these guys want to win and, like mm-hmm. instantly the two of them are just going for flash pins they're just fucking throwing everything they can at each other um, Blitzkrieg is just like he does a handspring Muta elbow at one stage um, Hoovy is just out to hurt this man he he um, does a springboard drop kick when Blitzkrieg isn't even looking <laughs> like he's on his knees and, and Hoovy's just like no fuck it I'm going Um Again, like the Hoovy's Tope Suicida over the top rope mm. is fucking nuts. You want to talk about yeah. arrowing to the ground. It's proper like Undertaker dive, but about four times faster. And onto a man about four times smaller than anyone Undertaker ever fucking landed on. Yeah, <laughs> including Sim Snooker. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, like, I could just talk about how much I love this match without actually telling you anything that happens because mm. one thing that really struck me at the very start is how like even on the entrances and in the early couple of seconds before they touched these two guys were fucking hyped up yeah, they, they were on fucking they were on this was you got the feeling these two guys and this will come as a shock to nobody about um, Hoovy in particular had a chip on their shoulder and they were coming out here to steal the show yeah I don't know who agented this I don't know if somebody got in their ear before this and said you know what you're on a pay-per-view go out there and show us what you can do here's fucking whatever it was 8 to 10 minutes just go fucking Mm. nuts Um, whatever it was worked because like you said Hoovy you can see in his eyes like when he's coming out he is jazzed he's fucking up for this and Blitzkrieg for all his faults and you know the guy was green they even mentioned on commentary like he's had less than 100 matches in his career and here he mm-hmm. is on the pay-per-view like um, and he even has a couple of slips at one stage in the match um, there's one botch in particular towards the end of the match where they're on the top rope and I don't know whether they were trying to go for like a, a like a spinning DDT or a spinning or reverse DDT or something but the two of them kind of just fall off the rope together yeah but even with that I just can't help but just fucking I just love this match I don't know like it's it's just so this is 1999 WCW forget everything that comes after this this is this pay-per-view and is epitomized by this opening match for me yeah and it's do you know what like you do notice where it's kind of rough around the edges, but I don't think it hurts the match. Now, I don't necessarily think it, it helps the match no. all that much, but I think I, I think if a match like this that has that kind of sloppiness to it happens now, we're a lot harder than than we were then. Mm-hmm. Because, again, even though there are sloppy elements of it, you're still seeing a bunch of shit you've never seen before with these guys. And, and listen, fucking Ray Phoenix and... Will Ospreay could go out and have this match on Dynamite this week and do it with mm. their eyes closed and not have a fucking single flub. Yeah. But that's not the point. It's that these two guys went out here in 1999 when it was still all about fucking steroids and fucking huge guys and, you know, not people taking my spot and all that shit. Mm. And these two just went out and had this match. Yeah. And to me, as a 13 year old at the time, it just blew me away. Um, I mean, the finish. 
I mean, what did what did you think of the finish as someone who probably hasn't seen it in a long time? I thought a man died. <laughs> I like this was like it was a super hoovy driver. Yeah, and I I have never seen a man take the hoovy driver more vertically. Like this was if this was a Looney Tunes cartoon, like his head is planted into the ground and he's stuck bolt yeah, upright. Bolt upright yeah. Like yeah. again, kind of, kind of was kind of sat here, kind of half watching the match with me, and yeah. I knew it was coming, and I was like, "Oh, watch this!" And he winced. Yeah, he's like, I shrieked. He's like, he he landed on his head. I was like, "Yep, he yeah. did." Um, yeah. and we should say that finish comes after, um, Blitzkrieg goes for the Sky Twister press misses, eats the fucking canvas, um, mm-hmm. Hoovy goes to the Kahoovy driver, which is countered into an unbelievable small package near Vol, which the whole yep. crowd was up for. Mm-hmm. Um, Blitzkrieg does some kind of like top rope twisting, like um, like a victory roll almost off the top rope, yep. um, which gets a near fall, and then he goes for it again, only this time it gets countered into the Hoovy driver, which is just, I mean, the commentator shriek. An unbelievable finish to what is... Absolutely my favourite WCW opener we've seen and probably will yeah. see. Uh it's my favourite since the um since the Booker double duty opener. Mm. Uh which was was that Spring Stampede ninety no, eight? That was no. Super Bowl ninety eight. Sla- Super Bowl, yes. Yeah. Um that was awesome. Uh this is right up there. Um does it touch the you know, the the, the gold standard of Ray versus Angle? No. I, no, it doesn't. But it's it's kind of like you said; it's his own thing, and it's it's special. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's special uh, to me for different reasons. Uh, there was a couple of uh, there was a couple of bits in here. Like there was, uh, I've never seen a faster headlock switch yeah. than one Blitzkrieg does here. It just looks such a simple spot, but done like so quick. Um, I I had a feeling that the intention, not just from the two men, but from the entire company, was to blow people's minds with this match because the commentary was clearly briefed to hype this shit up from the very start mm-hmm. of the match. Like Tony has a line uh, right after the bell rings about how you were going to get your money's worth for this pay per view in the first match, um, and they weren't wrong. I th- I, you know, they're... I get the impression that they were all in with the crew's weights again at this point. Like, yeah. they thought they could do something again. Um, and I mean, like, two of the... Like, th- this isn't the only um, thing. You know, they, they also have a, a, a... Like, another match on this show. The, the Cruiserweight title match. Uh, no, or, sorry. No, they have the... Um, they have the tag team champions facing each other mm-hmm. to face the winner of this match yeah. tomorrow night uh, on Nitro so they're like putting two cruiserweight matches on one show and using it to garner interest in Nitro yeah. which is so refreshing yeah it's it's forward planning and it's hmm. it's nice that like we now get another Hoovy Ray match but yeah. it's different because there's like they've built to it it's not just thrown out Hoovy and Ray mm-hmm. which absolutely you could do yeah. And it'd be good, but now it's like they've they've built to it and it means something. Yeah. Um so moving on to the next match, we get a first we get a recap of the hardcore dudes feuds um over the last couple of months. Fire extinguishers, chastity, the whole shebang. Raven has moved on from this feud. Uh, we will talk about him later. But we are left with Hack versus Bam Bam. Uh, and I am just going to do the big spoiler right out of the gates here, Lee. I love this. Yes. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> this is this is the kind of like before it got done to and beaten to death. Mm-hmm. This is the fun, fucking stupid garbage brawl yeah. that you want from like a a hardcore but not ECW level hardcore match. Do you remember when the WWF hardcore division was fun? Yeah, yeah, man. This is exactly this is what, what this, this kind is. of thing is. Yeah, 
yeah. And we'd get like we'd get matches like this from time to time when like you have a hardcore title later and mm-hmm. you have people like fucking screaming Norman Smiley in his football gear yeah. and you have fucking crazy old Terry Funk show back up and shit like that. Mm-hmm. So it does have its moments, but look, I'm just gonna say it here, and this feels super weird to say. Hacks on a fucking roll, man. <laughs> I rewatched that uh, that hack match from um, Thunder last week, mm. and like, man, it starts that started off boring, and we were talking about the whole he was like actively trying to blow his leg out at some point, but like, when you actually listen to the crowd and focus on the kind of like how that match ramps up pace wise, like hack the hacker really got him going. I mean, um, look. look. Hack got into shape for this WCW run. So he yeah. was all in on giving this a go. And look, I, I will never deny there is an appeal to the Sandman. There is. Of course there is. <laughs> you know, it is limited, <laughs> extremely limited, but he is in his niche right now and he is doing very well. As this us. is a man that Vince McMahon saw something in, in spite of him yeah. being out of shape, yeah, uh, uninspired and, you know, what, 10 years older. Yeah. Uh, great, great. Maybe my favorite. There's a couple of really corking lines on Coventry tonight. Like they have, there's like the whole middle of the show. They and I both kind of tuned out for a little while. Mm. But um, when the three lads, uh, Tony, Brain, and Tanae are on tonight, there are some really good lines. And uh, in a deadpan Tony sort of way, as this match is heading to the ring during the entrances, he goes. I would venture this will be a little different from what we just saw. Yeah. <laughs> you are not fucking kidding, mate. I, I love that the three of them, as soon as Chastity come out, are just like, um, yeah, so that's Raven's sister. Mike, what do you think of Chastity? <laughs> They're trying to get Mike to, Mike, is your wife watching? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Okay, you can tell us then. What do you think of her? I think she's a lovely young lady. <laughs> Tony getting horny on name for Chastity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so Bam Bam comes out with what would later in the the Fed become known as kind of like Raven Stick, where the, but not a cart shopping weapons, cart. Yeah. He comes out with like the prison laundry basket full of toys. Um, they meet in the aisle to brawl, and they do like the pushing the trolley back and forth into each other a bit, which I I I like. Um, Hack I meant to say as well as coming out wrapped in barbed wire has like a table over his shoulder, boombox style. Um, so they're they're brawling in the aisle. Then they go up towards the stage, and you know we are very much on record on this podcast. Um, any time a set is used as an offensive weapon in wrestling, we are happy on board. Yeah. Um, Hack, in spite of the fact that he carried out a table himself already, uh, when he gets up and knocks down Bam Bam. Uh, he reveals that obviously earlier in the evening he had come out and stashed a table under the station wagon that made part of the set. Under the hay bales, uh, there lay a table. And he sets up the table, sets up Bam Bam on it. And um, in spite of the station wagon wobbling and Hack nearly falling off and dying, he then executes a somersault off the, uh, off the station wagon. You're, you're saying a station wagon, wagon. I'm saying a stagecoach. Oh, sta- yeah, stagecoach. Yeah, yeah, station yeah. wagon is something totally different. Yeah, yeah. I, why do I keep saying that? Yeah, um, yeah no, stagecoach. Um, yeah, no. I, I'm mixing up my American lingo. Hack, Sorry, Hack friends. nearly fucking goes face first off the stagecoach as he's trying to steady himself. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. Just classic. Fucking great moment. Um, yeah. I, I bet, well, another great moment is like within seconds of that, like Bam Bam has recovered, picks up half of the shattered table and just fucks, fucks it, it at the hack's head. Yeah. Um, I will say there's very little selling in this match. Um, yes, in spite of the fact that they take several horrific shots yes. with weapons and several horrific bumps, not least of which was they're coming back towards the ring and Bam Bam has Hack by the back of the head and he throws him into the laundry oh. basket and he takes the handstand bump into the laundry basket. Something that's not particularly solid, you know, because it's on wheels. <laughs> yeah. Now, it was like all well and good, relatively speaking. He did that very same bump on Thunder into the railings. against yeah. It was Mikey. It was Mikey, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
So he does the handstand bump against Mikey into the railings. Uh, not so bad, because as you said, it's a rigid thing. He can kind of predict how it's going to go. But yeah, this is like a laundry basket. Um, which I suppose, actually, now that I think about it, the laundry basket, they're long-term, long-term storytelling. Chastity. Uh, Popped came out over, yeah, with yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. This company, I'll tell you. Um, Ke- Kevin, a- so, Kevin Ash with his storyboard backstage. Yeah. Um, ha- the next couple of minutes is just hack getting fucking battered and barely selling like anything that is not nailed down <laughs> uh, bam bam because the whole time that they were up by the um the stagecoach um chastity was emptying out the basket into the ring mm. uh to help out um hack and by the time they come back it's all just things for bam bam to hit hack with um we should say at that at this stage tony decides to shit on the trash cans and trash can lids as weapons. Yeah. And then Bam Bam hits uh, Hack in the head as hard as he can with a trash can lid, to which Tanay and Brain at the very same time, but I guess that doesn't hurt Tony, does it? Uh, yeah. And Tony is just Tony's just like, oh, well, well, no, that's not what I said. So I said, it sounds good. Uh, <laughs> and then Bam Bam takes out a weapon that I don't think I had seen used before or possibly since in professional wrestling, and that is the salad bowl. Yes, that's an unusual one. Yeah, I kind of there was maybe umpteen variations on a uh, tossed salad and scrambled eggs kind of joke because I've been watching a lot of Frasier lately. Um, but I, I left it I left it aside <laughs> for this but the salad bowl was a novelty uh, that was not lost on me um, and here we have uh, kind of it reminds me of what we were talking about the Scott Hall match um, or the Razor match and um, there's a bit here where Hack tries to do a is it a suplex? He tries for a suplex uh, yeah he, so he reverses a suplex attempt and he tries to do a suplex of his own. And the knee he had tried his best to do in on Thunder buckles. Um, so long-term storytelling, Lee. No, I just think he couldn't get Bammer up. <laughs> <And> his <laughs> knee buckles. Yeah. Um, the, the, the thing that was, that was that's kind of sucked about this is that, like, I I watched that Thunder weeks ago. And I immediately picked up on that. Yeah. Three commentators whose job it is to pick up on shit like that, who at least one of whom watched, watched yeah. this show and commentated You're on it. You're saying at least, at least one, the only one. The only one. And it would be made a point of that the rest of them didn't later on. Um, Actually, or was it in the first match? I think it was I think, in the opener, I think it was in the wasn't opener it? where Tanae was just like, well, Thunder was on. Wednesday this week, Bobby. That's why you didn't see it on Thursday. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. And they were like, "Was Thunder on this week?" Yeah, yeah I was like, "Oh my god, burying the fucking show, lads." Um, but yeah, so yeah, Tanae doesn't pick up on it. Um, disappointing. Uh, Hack does uh, a bulldog across this ladder he found. Uh, then another table comes out, uh, as well as a safety rail. And uh, when the safety rail comes out, Tony comments, "I love a man who brings a safety rail into the ring." <laughs> <laughs> because it's an everyday occurrence apparently um, yeah, yeah yeah no it was at this point where i just wrote down this match is so dumb i love it yeah uh hack goes up on the ladder for no reason speaking of dumb he gets flung off the ladder over the top rope <laughs> through a table that he had set up between the apron and the rail hack attempts uh he has the the rail kind of balancing on the middle rope Bam Bam balanced on that. He tries to do the guillotine leg drop, but um, his crotch eats nothing but fence, <laughs> which had to be unpleasant. Um, as I said here, he gets a fence to the dick. Um, and then when he does it, this is one of the moments that, uh, this night where I can audibly hear a fan shit on somebody in the ring. He does it, and there's a beat, and then a guy in the crowd goes, Bad move! <laughs> I love that moment where you just hear a fan. Chastity's in the ring and she's got the fire extinguisher again, but she can't get it working. Weirdly, Bam Bam has the the secret sauce, the the magic spell that makes it work because he just grabs it and is immediately able to spray her in payback for um, it happening to him in the three-way. Uh, Hack is able to use this time to sneak attack him with the kendo stick. Though. We should, we should say that Bam Bammer sprays Chastity with the 
Fire extinguisher in a place where no fire extinguisher should ever be sprayed. No, 100%. Um, both up on the top rope now, and we get, like, it didn't look great, but the idea was devastating. A greetings from Asbury Park through the table. It was less of a greetings from Asbury Park and more of, like, an Scoop air raid crash. Yeah, yeah. Um... And I loved uh, the line at the end of this from Bobby Heenan that was probably not advisable by the WCW legal team, which was Tony saying, don't try this in your backyard during the replay. And Heenan going, yeah, try it in your house instead. It's way more fun. And then pauses for a beat and then goes, actually, try it in Tony's house. (laughs) Yeah, when Bobby's on, he's on. Um, and we go from on to off for the next little while on this show. First up in a match that absolutely no one asked for, we had poor Mikey Whipwreck in only his third match in WCW uh, against Scotty Riggs. And what, like we said it on the Go Home Show, what a weird fucking matchup. And what the fuck is Scotty Riggs doing these days? Apparently he's been watching a lot of Rick Rude tapes. Rick, is, he's somewhere halfway between Rick Rude and, like, the narcissist Lex Luger. I mean, he had some cool um, late 90s ring gear. He he, yeah. he looked like every CAW wrestler on, um, like, WWF Raw. Yeah. With, like, the weird cross logo and red and black pants. It's, it's such a misreading. In, well, may, like, and maybe... Look, I'm assuming from the office point of view, this match was sent out to die. But from a producing and actually wrestling the match point of view for these two guys, I find it so weird and such a misreading of the room to have phenomenal cruiserweight action, heated garbage brawl that the crowd got super into by the end. Mm -hmm. And then these two cunts just come out and razzle. Yeah. And not very well. No. Like my look, look, Mikey's Grant. Don't get me wrong, a fucking Scotty man. <laughs> it ain't happening, is it? And uh, Scotty Riggs is not happening <laughs> in nineteen ninety nine. I hate to tell anybody who was like who was waiting to see how this all played out. It's not happening. Yeah, fucking. Hell. It'd be one thing if they put out two guys that were over to wrestle. Like if there was like a yeah. Buff Bagwell match against I don't know Mikey. Mm. It might have got some kind of reaction. But putting out Scotty Riggs, no, it's not the mm-hmm. one. Uh, I will say in terms of um, in terms of consistency across the show, third match in a row, third shriek uh, in a row, as there's a moment where uh, Scotty shoulder tackles <sighs> Mikey off the apron and the back of his head hits the guardrail so fucking hard. Mikey, man, he did not need to do that bump. I don't know if anybody like has seen Mikey over the last 15 years or so, but that dude moves exactly like a guy who was doing stuff like this mm-hmm. through the 90s you would expect to move. Um, God almighty. Uh, Match is absolutely nothing, and it ends absolutely out of nowhere in the worst way possible. Uh, I could mean that, where just um, Riggs just hits him with a flying forearm and wins. Yeah, not even a good flying forearm. No, no, this was a phenomenal forearm. This was not, my friend. Remember when R Truth went through that weird stage of using a uh, flying forearm as his finish? Vaguely. You'd like, do that, like, twisting flying forearm. Mm. Weird. Yeah. Not good. Um, Yeah, nothing really more to say about this. On to the next. We have Conan versus the Disco Inferno. Uh, we get the world's most obnoxious video package as it introduces us to the match. Um, it need, it I don't us... even think we got the whole video package because no. I remember they showed like both music videos. Yeah, that's because I, I held off on watching the Disco version. Okay. Because you were saying that it was on the pay-per-view. But yeah, this was a condensed version. Yeah, well, obviously for copyright reasons, they had to take out certain things so um, or or perhaps because like um disco super racist during well, this like this is i don't know that is genuinely genuinely fucking upsetting i don't know have you ever interacted with one disco inferno uh no um really because he he smells vaguely like he smells vaguely like uh, the big show's farts so i kind of stay away from him i don't know dave it's crazy that you go on holidays 
<laughs> and after three years of me not getting us into trouble with one Glen Glenbert disco and fair enough, um, all it takes is one fucking quote tweet and you have him in our mentions. I know, yeah. And he didn't respond to me when he said that it was news to him. He was denying that the big show thing. If any, By the way, if anybody missed this, uh, Eddie Kingston had a succession of fabulous tweets yes. last week. Um, the jewel and the crown for both of us being where he completely dismissed, just obliterated Glenn Gilberti by saying that he heard the story about how the giant farted in his face. Yep. Um, and say and ended the tweet with "You ain't no man." Um, and yeah, so it, I don't know if he had commented much on it throughout the day, but he responded to our quote tweet um, by saying it was news to him that it happened, and I innocently inquired that maybe it wasn't him maybe it was la cucaracha that got farted in the face um but uh as of press time <laughs> glenn gilberti hasn't responded to me on that um yeah no f- fuck this go i mean <laughs> um this is billed as a one fall grudge match um i will say this I do not know the name of the person who mixed sound for WCW in 1999, but know this. I hate them. Oh, God, why? They can't, you can't hear fucking anything. Yeah, it's what you really can't hear any of Penzer's intros on this show. And there's, like, the classic WCW is you can't hear the first half of what Penzer says. Yeah. And they finally go, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Turn on his mic, right? All you're hearing is that, you know, I don't want to ape uh, OSW but they nailed it in that like all you ever hear from Penzer is like the <laughs> for every introduction um, that the mic isn't on for which is a lot but also the sound mixing on the video package is horrible um, the, the mixing on the entrance music the mixing on Penzer it's uh, the commentary it's all fucking horrible and this is one of there's a couple of moments on the show where all these like weirdly mixed sounds are all kind of competing for ear space. <laughs> and it's it's abysmal. It's truly abysmal. Um, um, I had, at this point, envisaged the editing bay for WCW in the production truck, the sound mixer, as just being a cat absentmindedly batting at a knob uh, that's just turning things randomly up and down. No, no, no. no. The, the knob was in the ring. He surely was. And what an outfit he was wearing, Lee. His urban, his blue urban camo gear with his glittery disco short and cowboy hat. Yeah. It, it's a look, I'll tell you. It certainly was. Um, Bobby outs himself once again as not watching uh, the shows um, because he's trying to doubt that disco is La Cucaracha. And Snake is like, uh, Bobby, on on Saturday night this week, they, they took his mask off. It, it's Disco. <laughs> He's like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, yeah, no, Bobby, it happened on Saturday night. <laughs> or, you know, they could at least clue the man in. Yeah, I know. yeah at least smarten him up. Um, Bobby and Tony are uh, declare themselves huge fans of Disco's music. Top 10 anime betrayals, my friend. <laughs> I never thought they'd stab me in the back like that. <laughs> Yeah, these two guys come out as well, right? So here's the thing, and it's one of the um, it's a bugbear of mine, um, and it's a bugbear of a lot of people. So it's not like a a special thing that annoys just me. Um, when there's a grudge match, literally, Penzer calls it a grudge match on their way to the ring, and then when in seconds they're just working holes. Lock up, yep. Head lock. Mm hmm. Fuck off. This match isn't good. No. Uh, walk and brawl, smoke and mirrors. It's boring as shit. It's, yeah. I, do I think they're trying? Yes. Do I think they're good? No. Um, In particular, and I think this is um, perhaps a, a very condemning thing to say. I sense Disco was trying very hard. That that's uh, excuse me. that that's what I was going to say. Um, I think Disco. I mean, look, he's an asshole. But 
on this particular run, the last couple of months, I can't say he hasn't been trying. Um, yeah. Conan just in this point, even in nineteen ninety nine, just is not capable of having um really good work rate matches. Um, he just looks blown up really early yeah. on. Um, mm-hmm. like it, it's kind of ironic that after he wins the match he's like into the camera going oh I can still go it's like yeah. I don't think you can pal I really don't think you can <laughs> I, I, I can still go well yeah that's you know a power of positive thought isn't going to get you so far pal <laughs> Um, there's two two big reactions in this. They do react um, for him winning and winning with Disco's finish, um, which is an interesting way to go about it. Um, they also popped for the the one eight seven, which is uh, the the cradle DDT, yeah. which is cool. Um, but otherwise, I can't think of a single redeeming thing. It ended. That's that's the redeeming feature. mm Hmm. Yeah, I don't still have to watch it, and I'll never have to watch it again. Hopefully. Next up, Cruiserweight Action. World Cruiserweight title. Um, It's our tag team champions, Rey Mysterio and Billy Kidman. This is the battle of the respectful tag champs. I like two things about this, Lee. One thing I already mentioned earlier on. Uh, the continuity of setting up the next challenger to prom- uh, earlier to promote Nitro. So there's a through line story-wise on this show, and it makes you want to tune in for the, f- the fallout on Nitro the following night. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. The other thing I like about this is that you have uh, members of a tag team that are involved in a singles match together, and they don't have to do the all tag teams must fight thing mm-hmm. that would get run into the fucking ground by you know WWE and TNA. In the years that follow. Um, Counters are plenty. Earlier on. Really fast action. Exactly what you'd expect from these two guys. Uh, Kidman saves Ray's life early on. On an apron moonsault. Yes. uh, Where I thought he was going to die. Speaking of near deaths. uh, Four matches. Four shrieks. Or five matches. Four shrieks. I had no shrieks. Apart from how bad the last match was. But in this one. uh, They are up doing spots near the rail. And uh, Ray does a head scissors, and in the spin on the head scissors, Ray goes head first into the metal steps, and I nearly lost my life. Yeah, again, it's one of those spots I really remembered from watching the show as a kid. Yeah. Um, and I think I think it's Shivani who points out like Ray gets really annoyed, kicks kicks the fucking the ring and, steps, and he's definitely. He's definitely like, how would you say it? Like rocked. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like it, it definitely, it takes him out of the match. It definitely jars him. Like yeah. yeah. Um, like I think if that were to happen now, like he wouldn't wrestle for a week. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like like you said, th- this match you get like the kind of early on you get like the mirroring each other's spots and these guys know each other so well. They're tag team partners, but it never mm. like. What I like about the match is it never devolves into oh we hate each other and I, I want to prove I'm the best man thing. Mm. It's well no I just want to be cruiserweight champion and yeah. While they're respectful to each other, it's not like oh I, I don't want to hurt my friend. It's just it's a match. Yeah, yeah. It's a good Re- good Re- match. Yeah. Um. So they go back in the ring for a huge uh, minute. Huge Luthez press uh, off the the rope. Back outside, Kidman does his running shooting star, which looked like it fucking sucked because he landed yep. parallel to Ray. Uh, all four of their knees <laughs> knocked into each other, and they were all clearly like, I'd say Ray was in an ice bath for hours after this match. <laughs> Is any wonder this man needed both his knees replaced? I know, yeah. Um, commentary gets distracted. Um, at this point because they're burying Heenan. Heenan mentions that they're tag champs and Tony and Tanae had already mentioned this so t- uh, Brain had clearly switched off and the lads weren't letting him forget that. Match slows down as we start coming to the end to kind of give us the opportunity to get a breather before the finishing stretch. Uh, Ray hits the avalanche bulldog that won him the belt. Uh, Ray is too casual on the pin because he thinks he has Kidman put away yet again. Kidman manages to kick out. Kidman gets a near fall. Then he reverses a power bomb. He goes for the shooting star press but gets crotched. Frankensteiner and a win. Uh, I don't think it's as um, 
individually memorable as some of their other matches or as the opener on the Mm pay-per-view but i thought this was an excellent little match like i'm going you know like in the three and a half sort of range yeah like you you want to talk about a match that isn't going to steal a show but when you look at a show in its totality that you go yeah that's a good match that that's this yeah this Mm -hmm. this is the type of match that elevates a a average show to a very good show yeah for sure um Let's let's actually something I, I meant to do at the start of the show is to go back and um have a look at the star ratings on mm. this show so far. So l- let's catch you up, right? Our opening match, Hoovy versus Blitzkrieg, four and a quarter. I'm do you know what? I'm giving it to Dave on that. I think that's oh, fair. Yeah, I can that's, see that. That's yeah, pretty yeah, fair. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think in the, like I needed to squint at this because this is one I thought I was going to disagree with him on and I'm thankful that I wasn't out to lunch on this. Uh, Bam Bam versus Hack, he gives three and a half to. Yeah, a good full match. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Mikey versus Scotty Riggs, star and a half. Yeah. Or sorry, ha- sorry, half a star. Yeah, that's, that's, ne- yeah, that's more need- accurate. Needlessly harsh, I'd say, but yeah. Um... Conan versus Disco, one and a quarter stars, uh, and the Cruiserweight title match, uh, three stars, which I think was a little bit stingy. A little bit stingy. Yeah, you got about three and a half, three and a quarter, three quarters. Oh, yeah. I, I'd go three and a half. I'd say it's like just about under, under you know, what old Lanza would call notebook. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Moving on from there, and I'll try to keep us abreast of these star ratings as we go. We get to a match that caused Lee to, in the middle of his screening of this pay-per-view, text me about how giddy he was to talk about this next match. This is non-title, as the, the titles had been taken out of the equation uh, on at Club Lavelle. This is Perry Saturn and Raven versus the four horsemen of Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko with Arn Anderson. Uh, we got a really thorough recap of the feud. Yeah. And at this point, I'm just like, what company is this? Because they've done a really good job on this show every single match telling you why these guys are fighting and why it's important. It feels like a real tonal shift in what's going on in the company, doesn't it? Like, what the fuck? Because the TV has not been... Like, there again, this is like whoever makes their video packages and shit and does their research... Uh, are really putting in a shift here to make very discordant television programs seem like there was a really big plan. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say this feud is maybe the one exception where I feel there was a very consistent through line of storytelling. But anyway, um, I really like the placement of this match on the show. It comes after Ray and Kidman. So the current tag champs have their match and now you have the match that that match spun off of if you will um so that's cool it's like these are two related chapters in the wcw book at the moment so that's cool um this feels from the horseman's entrance like a big time match they come out here and firstly i want to say right arn looks like he could unretire any minute arn is like the same thing written down Arn is looking trim. Arn is looking buff. Do you know what? Arn is looking tan. He looks baby. so good off the gas. Like, he, he's yeah. lost that kind of, like, you know, he had the dad bod before it was a dad bod thing. Yeah. Yeah. He's trim. He's, like you said, he's tanned. He looks fucking ready to go. Like Looks a million dollars. Um, but I, I can't agree any stronger with you then. As soon as that horseman music hits, after the video packages... I was just like, right, let's fucking go. Um, mm. Again, I've I've said this so many times. I I've seen this match. I cannot re- recall how many times I loved this match, and I I was I, so nervous to revisit this match. Do you know what I'm going to say to you about this match, Lee? Might be controversial to people listening to this, but I don't think it's going to be controversial to us. Based on, one, how good the match was and how good you could probably guess it was going to be before it even happened, Mm -hmm. and how well this match was received by the crowd, you could have main evented the pay-per-view with this and people would have gone home happy. I think if if the face team had won, I 100% agree with you. 
yeah. Um, yeah, I I was so nervous because of I had never watched this match with a critical eye. If that makes sense. Yeah. You'd watched it as a fan, not as so many times I've watched it, it as a fan, and I, was like, I knew it was good, but I didn't yeah. want to rewatch it and go, "Oh God!" Like having seen the whole feud in its entirety mm. and knowing yeah. where everything came from, and then watch it and go, uh. "Yeah, you didn't want to have that." I didn't want, yeah, I didn't want to have it taken away from me, and I'm so I was so glad. Like watching it again, I was so into it. Extremely disappointed with the. Uh, the Fed dubbing the the Raven theme song. I, I put this out on Twitter. I need somebody to find the original audio of Raven and Saturn's entrance mm. and put it online somewhere because again, ingrained it it's born in my memory. Yeah, this isn't. It's an arena, so the lighting does like the the lighting if indoors doesn't change. Like it's still the arena lighting. Mm-hmm. But in my mind, it always like the horseman come out, and then the arena gets darker. And from yeah. that point on, in the whole show, the whole show was kind of in a like just a nighttime mode, if you will. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. Raven and Saturn's entrance is just so incredible. Like, when the fact that it's overdubbed, you lose the fans, you lose Raven's fucking incredible music. And it just takes away so much on the network. I fucking hate, hate WWE that they have changed <laughs> so much wrestling history for the fact that they won't fucking pay Jimmy Hart five cents to play a song. I I also hate that WWF theme song he had. Oh, it's so bad. Um, like, not to get into it, a bigger conversation just based off of this but like WWE bought all of wrestling's history up until a certain point mm-hmm. and they have just decided to change it all yeah and unfortunately so much will have been lost because they won't pay for a song or didn't like a certain wrestler or decided that wasn't worthwhile putting out until we decided that they needed to go out. and it's so frustrating yeah. as a wrestling fan to turn on a fucking WCW show from 1995 and you get dubbed over music. I mean, look, this is a company that, like, they've had the WWE Network since, what, 2014, is it? And uh, when we started this podcast, not all of Thunder was up there yet. Incredible. There were conversations in the first six months or so of us doing this podcast where we're like... We might actually run out of Nitro or uh, Thunders. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to like Sorting. try and yeah. purchase them somewhere or, or figure out something. Um, and even though we did get them in the end, and it is handy to have, fuck, I do not like giving them my coin for their version of history. Um, but look, that is the one critical thing we're going to say because this segment, this match, fucking rocks. No, we we are self-professed into the whole Raven Saturn story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pretty much since we began this podcast. <laughs> it is the it is the only story that was going when this podcast started that is still going. I was going. just going to say, Raven has been feuding with Chris Benoit since this podcast began. Yeah. So this is now a year and a half later in, in real time. These yeah. two are still going at it. And we have loved pretty much what 90% of their matches and interactions yeah yeah you throw in two great wrestlers like Galenko and Saturn in there as well and it's incredible but not only us Mm -hmm. the fans my god are the fans so into Raven and Saturn this crowd are going crazy before they even touch right they are absolutely like this is clearly there's two matches that they are super hyped for this and the Nash mm-hmm. Goldberg match, and in the main event, they are hyped to see Sting. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say they're hyped for the match in the way that they're hyped for this match and the the Goldberg match, um, but they are so excited. Um, also, somebody else who's excited and springs back to life after two matches uh, in the Abyss is Bobby Heenan. Bobby Heenan is having the time of his life during this match. 
and he is putting over shit left, right, and center. And it, like straight away into this match, he talks about look, wrestling styles. I know how these guys look. They look like outsiders. They look like freaks. They're talking about how, like, what the hell is Saturn wearing and Mm -hmm. shit like that. But he's like, you guys ought to know that Raven and Saturn can do absolutely everything that Benoit and Malenko can do. I love that. These are are four supremely talented wrestlers Mm -hmm. in spite of, like, outward appearances, um, which is really, really cool. Um... Double A and Malenko beat down Raven, so Raven gets thrown out uh, as the ref is distracted. Um, and Heenan, again, with some insight, he's like, listen, I used to manage this guy. Aaron Anderson will do anything for an advantage mm-hmm. for himself or for the people that he's with. Um, he also has another line in here earlier on because it's like, Raven is the sympathetic baby face that's taken all the heat in this match. Um, in the first half and he talks about how look I can't speak to the other three but I can tell you one thing is that Raven will never give up and then and then he goes and you know what Saturn would never give up and then he goes you know what I don't think Malenko would either (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. He talks about he's like these, basically these are tough yeah. bastards. Is it's what he's just, telling it's you. Fucking great. I, Bobby is so into these four wrestlers together. It's it. I love it. Honestly, uh, my uh, one of my favorite running bits during Horseman or Flair matches now is um, it takes several minutes for it to dawn on the commentators that it's Charles mm-hmm. Robinson <laughs> refereeing the match. So there's like um, there's a a Raven roll up that's missed quote-unquote missed and today goes hey it's charles robinson <laughs> and uh, tony's like hey look he was genuinely distracted i'm not going to put the blame for him on that one but it's just planting the seed mm-hmm. in your head that if something it's keeping you a little bit nervous that the baby faces might get fucked at any moment here um so i like that just having that kind of loaded gun waiting stage left that that could be shot at any minute um lee about halfway through this match saturn hot tag oh boy how good was it yeah so after saturn comes in there is like this incredible sequence um where saturn goes for a dvd it gets stopped benoit does a german with a drop kick from malenko thrown in um Raven comes in, tries for the even flow, that gets blocked. Malenko then nails a tiger bomb into the clover leaf, and uh, Raven gets to the ropes. Oh no, it's not Raven. Yeah. Sorry, it's Saturn gets the ropes. Um, Saturn then hits the DVD on Malenko, and Chris Benoit breaks it up with a swan dive headbutt. Just yeah. a fucking phenomenal sequence. Yeah. Incredible. I just, I was up fucking watching this. Ah, oh, I love so, it. So he breaks it up with the diving headbutt and then um, Malenko rolls over. One, two. Aaron was on the apron ready to celebrate mm-hmm. and Saturn is still alive. And Aaron sells yeah. it like he's just seen one of his boys shot. Um, then we get uh, Saturn and Benoit stand toe to toe chops from Benoit that cause Saturn to buckle the horsemen then start doing what they do best isolating Saturn double teaming Saturn Raven is slowly getting his bearings back getting onto the apron Malenko gets the sleeper in he's choking out Saturn Mm -hmm. it's broken up by Raven Benoit takes out Raven again the horsemen do a quick switch gorgeous northern light suplex from Benoit for two uh, Saturn, this is the this is the point of, of this part of the match, hearkening back on what we said Heenan said about them earlier on. Saturn is barely hanging on, but he is yeah. hanging on. Saturn ducks a corner clothesline from Merlenko and runs into a sunset flip on Benoit. I thought that was a class spot where he's just, he's in the corner, the two lads are kind of, you know, uh, in a line towards him. Uh, ducks the clothesline from Malenko and then it, without breaking stride tries a sunset yep. flip for two uh, on Benoit uh, Malenko gets the sleeper back in the fans are rallying around Saturn at this point he gets up belly to back to break the hold inching 
inching to the corner. Malenko nearly gets to him, but we get the tag. Raven's in. He's throwing fucking bombs. Sends Malenko out. Starts slugging away at Benoit. Saturn throws in a chair. And as soon as the chair comes in, everyone knows what's about to happen. Fucking pop for the chair being brought into the ring. Because they knew. And the pop that the drop toe hold onto the chair then gets is incredible. Oh, it's so great. Uh, On the outside, Saturn goes for a splash through a table onto Malenko. Arn at the last second pulls Malenko off. Saturn's dead, glassy eyed. Mm -hmm. Um, He gets back in, blocks a chair shot. Um, Raven hits the even flow. Raven crawls on top, but Aaron places a chair on Raven's head and Benoit with the most gruesome, sacrificial headbutt onto the chair, onto Raven, and Malenko's able to make the cover, and it's over. What a fucking match, Lee. Benoit is bleeding. Everyone's dead. The replay shows that he really hit that fucking chair. Yeah, no, look, I, I don't think we need, need to relitigate everything about Chris Benoit and what he put his fucking head through. Yeah. But, like, just... It, it plays into the story so well that Aaron has these guys so fucking... like. The horsemen are life, and that's what it is. And you will do anything to win. Like Heenan says it on commentary, Aaron would do anything to get an advantage. So Chris Benoit diving headfirst onto a fucking steel chair. You know what he'll do for Aaron. Uh, yeah. Just from the hot tag on to Raven on. Um, uh, just this match. I, I think it's incredible. I genuinely mean this. It is my favorite. WCW match we have watched bar none Uncle Dave three and a half get the fuck this is incredible tag team wrestling like bear in mind Dave was watching all this stuff at the time so he knew all the stories coming into this yeah Uh, that's just so low like I'd be gone like me personally for me this is like four and three quarters I just think it's phenomenal yeah on a personal, I think like objective, I'm I'm thinking four, possibly four point two five. Yeah. But in terms of personal enjoyment, but in the context of this is all we're watching for this show, yeah, it's it's one of the best we've seen. It's it's maybe the most alive I've felt since that uh, Raven Saturn match. Mm-hmm. But that that one caught uh, us off guard by being so yes. incredible. This one, you knew. I like I, uh, I in the back of my head knew it was good, and I just didn't. Yeah. Like, again, I just it just blew me away, and I'm so happy mm. that we've now seen it because now I can go back and watch it at any time. Because yeah, I've deprived myself for God, how many years have we doing the show? Uh, three, and we knew we were going to do it for like what three months before that. So yeah. like the last three and a half years, I've stopped myself from going back and watching this match, one of my mm. favorite matches of all time, and I'm so glad we have now watched it again. It's so good, and it's so good. I'd go back and watch it right after this show, <sighs> gladly. Um, next up, show keeps moving on a pace. Uh, we get a very in-depth recap of the stripping of the US title from Scott Hall and the recap of the whole tournament. Let's you know what the stakes are, why we're here. Great. <laughs> uh, just again, just blown away by this company actually doing the work mm-hmm. uh, and letting you know. Uh, this leads us into our WCW United States Heavyweight Title Tournament final match: Booker T versus Scott Steiner. Now, this is this maybe, is also a martial arts division title match. This is also a martial arts division title match. Now, here is what I want to say about this. I want to be very clear in my distinction here. I think, as a match, this was only okay. Mm-hmm. But as this match went on, and by its end, I think... uh, Look, this is the one where I think maybe I'm out to lunch. And maybe I was just riding high from this tag match. And I was feeling good. One of my favourite heel performances in a match. From Scott Steiner in this by the end. He He didn't have me won over at the start. And we'll talk about it in a second. But by the end, he was the most despicable, detestable, 
I fucking hate this prick heel that I've seen on one of these pay-per-views in absolutely ages. I think I'm the opposite to you and that I came in on such a high after the tag match that this yeah. match was such a disappointment to me. Yeah. Oh look, as a like mechanically as a match, like I said, it's it's very it it doesn't do a whole lot for me. But as a we're establishing this guy as a serious top level heel in this company, I think it did excellent. Now, work. listen, my my very first note is this is the beginning of Big Papa Pump as a big deal in this company because this yeah. this is it now. He's a made man after yeah. this base. Well, not a made man, but he's basically they're, they're saying to you, right? He is now upper echelon in this company. Yeah, and and it's funny. Something I was actually thinking of is how these two guys followed each other up through the company. Do you know what has a very similar trajectory to what the Rock and Triple H? Kind of, yeah, because these are two guys who were known for tag mm-hmm. teams early in their career. They, at different points, Booker leaves Harlem Heat first, but the Steiners break up as well. They feud. Then the two of them are in the TV title division, and they come across each other there. Now they're feuding over the US title, and a year from now, they're feuding over the world Mm -hmm. title. Now, if they had hit the gas and put the two of them in the main event scene in 1999, maybe we'd be talking about a little bit more of a successful company than they were at that stage. Because yep. I think these, I think we have been saying since the start of this podcast that Booker was ready for a big push. Uh, and I think we're now at the stage where, not physically, but as a character, Scott Steiner is ready. Yeah, I, I think, again, it, it's jarring to me to see how how... I don't want to say he's finished as an athlete, but yeah. just how broken down Scott Steiner already was at this point in 1999. It's, it, it's not, it, it's, it's more drastic, but it kind of reminds me in what a disappointing thing it is uh, as, you know how Samoa Joe only got like the next level confidence and ability to speak and cut promos right when his body was starting to fail yeah. him. And this is a more extreme version of this is like so quickly Scott Steiner over the course of the last like nine months has pieced together this character that makes him a main event level character. But during this time, like his body is rapidly breaking down. Like you, you look at how long he goes without matches. Like his body is absolutely falling apart. And now, Look, a major part of that, a major problem, is probably the amount of steroids he's putting into his body. I have not one doubt in my mind, friend. Um, like, again, we should say, I think we say it every time we see him, he is fucking enormous on this show. Yeah. Like, huge. Like, sickeningly huge. Yeah. Um, yeah, and vascular, just disgusting. Um... But let, let's let's go to the actual match. So he spends ages outside trash talking vans. This is a bit where I wasn't necessarily on board with it. He's he's trash talking the fans. Um, there's a bit that I did like where he has a woman in the crowd start caressing him as he's shit talking the, the man that she's with. I thought that was that was kind of funny. Um, he gets bleeped out as well because he's swearing at the fans. Um, This bit I didn't so much like. Now, I do think the time he spends out here, Lee, and look, disagree with me if you do. um, I think the time he spends putting in the work of shit talk and the fans here pays off later in the match for him because he is getting nuclear reactions by the end of this match. Um, And even though I wasn't along on board with it for the first couple of minutes, I think it's partly because he did this at the start. Yeah, I mean, possibly. Um, yeah, maybe. I I don't know. I I just feel so differently to you on everything yeah. regarding Steiner and this match. That yeah, like, I I I just can't see it from that angle. I just see mm. it as like an overbearing. I'm a bad guy kind of shtick he went through, and mm. for me, it just didn't work. So 
Uh, I did like there was a very funny line from Tony in here where he said that um, about him threatening fans where he's like now that the Nitro commentary table is at ringside Scott Steiner is my best friend and I laughed at that because you can read into it in two ways one uh, Scott Steiner is a menace to referees and people at ringside so it's like I need to act like he's my best friend so he doesn't beat me up or is he saying that now that he's at ringside and he's so close to all these gross fans that he's actually in favour of Scott beating them I think up. a little bit of A, a little bit of B. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so Scott starts the match by getting Booker's... Oh, so here's another thing as well. Um, Booker, we love Booker on this show, and Booker, it was very generous in the ring in this match with Scott Steiner because he was at least reasonably content with working extremely snug in this mm-hmm. match to get over what a prick Scott Steiner was because he gets Booker's back and he is clubbing this poor fucker in the back of the head and it looks like it sucked to be Booker. Now, I think one problem I have is... 90% of Scott Steiner's offense in this match is just throwing his arms at Booker as hard as he can. Now, yeah. normally that's a good time have for all that are watching. Mm. Um, but I don't know. Like, for me, when you're having this supposed to be breakout fucking star making performance, mm. I don't know. Maybe just beating somebody fucking as hard as you can isn't the way to go. Mm. Um, now, Booker gives it back to him. He sure does. There's a, there's a few corner clotheslines, especially yeah. that I'm watching. Going, I had them written down. Yeah. My God, they look fucking tight. <laughs> um, I will say as well that like um, they they do you know whether how much of this the commentary knew about in advance, I'm not sure, but they do a really good job of weaving it into the story, where they talk about how he was so off put by like the interactions with the fans at the start of the match that what they're saying now is that he's basically in a blind rage he's lost complete focus and game plan there's none of the wrestling that the Steiners are traditionally known yeah. for he's just this he, he's just rage made flesh basically like he's just striking and hitting and clawing Um, I mean it's almost like somebody that takes a lot of roids has this kind of rage inside them yeah, I know, right? Uh, more extremely rough strikes from Scott. Booker ducks a clothesline, hits a forearm and a crescent kick, dumps him out of the ring and dives on him. He, he throws Scott at the fans. Uh, this is the bit where, like, a line was very nearly crossed that could have resulted in some lawsuits, where he throws Scott at the fans, and the fans are kind of all, pat, you know, kind of annoying him by patting him on the back. And he, without looking back, just throws his elbow back as hard as he can at the mm-hmm. fans. And I was like, oh, fuck. He is very lucky there that it didn't connect with anybody litigious. Um, they go to the opposite side of the ring, do the same deal. Uh, back in, and Scott is begging off, but Booker isn't a dumb baby face. He's not fooled. He keeps attacking him. Uh, takes Scott down, lays in some very tight punches. Uh the corner clotheslines that you mentioned, I was like, this is a stiff match. Mm-hmm. And I was I was just kind of along for the ride, man. Um, I, I, that was like, I was a bit, I wasn't feeling good about the, the when he was just striking Booker and there was no receipts. But as soon as Booker was just like, right, fucker, here you go. And gives him his receipts. I was like, okay, right, here we go. Here we go. I'm okay with this now. Uh, so he goes to do the 10 punch in the corner. Steiner powers out by lifting him and crotching him on the rope. Knocks him out again for the heat. Um, Tony says he believes Booker has been focusing on the weak back of Scott Steiner that had been, uh, he'd had numerous surgeries on in his youth. Uh, <laughs> the, and this is where, uh, again, it depends. Your mileage may vary. But at this point, I think they've done an okay job by now of establishing that refs are letting Scott do what he wants because they are fucking terrified of him. Um, Because he grabs a chair and he digs Booker twice between the shoulders with it. And all the ref can muster is like, hey. Yeah. Now, see, the chair shot didn't so much bother me because, you know, you see kind of, you know, oh, it's a title match and you kind of give them a little bit of discretion. 
it's more so what happens later on in the match that really pisses me off. And not in a good yeah. kind of, oh, I'm pissed off at the heel kind of mm-hmm. way. It's interesting, like, because this is one where I went the other way at it. And normally I'd totally be in lockstep with you. But, like, as a kind of, I'm kind of at the point where it's like, right, they've laid the groundwork that, now, what pisses me off, right, about it is if you're going to do this, you shouldn't have referees give so much discretion all up and down the card because the ideas of disqualifications are long out the fucking door in WCW. If you worked really hard to make Scott Steiner matches special where he's the only one who's getting to basically run rough shot on his opponents because all the refs are terrified of him. Yeah. Um, then it would mean more because they have, in fairness, they have put in the work to tell that story with him eating fines mm-hmm. and suspensions for attacking referees and things like that. The referees doing the thing where they were going on strike, refusing to to ref his matches and things like that. So that story is set. And I think I don't want to speak in your behalf, Lee, but would I be right in saying that if it wasn't for the fact that like all around WCW is this inconsistency with the rules, if it wasn't for that, this would make a lot more sense and be more powerful. Oh yeah, like if this was the only like you said, the only story in WCW where referees are letting people do what they want, it would make sense. And like you said, be be a lot more kind of it it would be more enjoyable. It'd stand out more. It'd be more meaningful. Mm. Instead, yeah. yeah, it just comes across as more just fucking angry roid rage man screams at little fucking referee like and it's it it's just fucking it's just annoying in a not good way. Yeah. Um. So back in clothesline elbow drop. Uh, one of the hallmarks of Scott Steiner then, where he does the the push ups. This is you know part of the uh, the the big pop pump character coming out there. Um. He pie faces the ref then and flexes. Uh. Again, this is the part we we significantly start diverging here at this point. So they say, look, normally he'd be, and you know, the commentary is reinforcing and reminding you of that story where they're just like, normally Scott would be right on the edge of being thrown out here, but these refs are scared of this guy. Uh, The crowd start chanting steroids at him, uh, belly to belly and a flex cover for two. Then he gets on top of the. This is, I think, the. This was a bridge too far for me, where he just like gets on the ref for not yep. counting three. Um, the next spot though, like I, I think if you got rid of that middle bit where he does the choking of the referee and went straight to this one, I, I kind of, I kind of liked this within the context of the match, like taking it as its own island, where he stands up. And he punts Booker in the balls as hard as he can and then stares the ref right in the face like, I fucking dare you to ring the bell. Um, I I liked that as a moment. Nah, see, see um, for me, it's just more fucking... It, it's not... It's not heelish. It's not fucking... It's not yeah. cool heel. It's not, oh, I want to see this guy get beaten up, endearing. Like, it's just stupid. I know. What I will say is, it gets the right reaction. It does. To be crowd. fair, I'm, pro- I'm probably the, crowd- the only one that feels the way I feel about it. Um. Yeah, I, I think I totally, in the wider context of WCW, you are completely right. I think what I'm doing here is I am, like I said, treating this match as an island. Like, I'm just thinking within the context of the Scott mm-hmm. Steiner story, I think this is great. Um. So, um... Da, da, da. Yeah, so soccer kicks him in the ball, stares down the ref. The crowd are actually horrified by this. Then comes, uh, I usually, when there isn't like uh, one person being a giant involved, I usually hate a bear hug spot. Um, but the end of this bear hug, bear hug spot got me good, Lee. So they're doing the bear hug and the crowd is rallying around Booker and he's doing the bit where like he's lifting his hands and what he's going to do, obviously, is he's going to drop his hands inside the uh, of Scott's arms and use like his strength tend to break out of the bear mm-hmm. hug. But as soon as he drops his hands inside the grip of um, Steiner, old amateur wrestler Scott Steiner flashes for a moment and hits him with an overhead belly to belly that just killed him i'd say that was good 
more, give me more of that Scott um, Steiner and less of the fucking yeah. you know fucking beating up on referees Scott Steiner uh, Booker hits a DDT out of nowhere the two of them stand up they start throwing bombs at each other but then uh, Scott has enough of an eye rake Booker shakes him off starts heating up uh, Booker comes out of the corner and Scott puts the ref in harm's way uh, doesn't deter Booker axe kick flapjack the ref is out, but Booker is starting to cook. He hits the sidekick, gets a visual yeah. pin that he counts himself. Um, he picks the ref up. Steiner nails both of them deliberately. Um, Steiner then tries a leapfrog, but Booker catches him with a slammer. Goes for the drop kick. Steiner lunges and crotches him, setting up the Frankensteiner. He wakes up the ref, makes the ref count, but Booker kicks out, and Steiner fucking lost it. He pulls something out of his tights. Booker blocks the first shot with it, goes to suplex him. But while he's uh, upside down in the suplex, Steiner hits him with it. and They both crumple the new ref out, but the old ref counts three. Uh, the match, I think, gets a two and a half from Dave. Um, again, I wouldn't go that much higher as a match, but as a storytelling device, I, I really thought I, I really enjoyed Scott's heel performance here. I'm more interested to see where this title run goes because it, in spite of being very familiar with this era of WCW, I don't remember a lot about Scott Steiner's run at this exact point. So I'm interested to see where, where he goes from here. Um, yeah, the, the the gap in our minds between here and when he's world title level is a bit fuzzy. Um, now, my, my head is telling me it's probably not going to be good, but... <laughs> I'm willing to give it a chance and Booker of course yeah. can I mean look he's still TV champion but he feels so far beyond being TV champion at the stage mm. yeah Um. so uh, then we get Ray in the internet location and again just to kind of like uh, one last thing on Scott during this segment is again the sound mix is part of the problem fuck whoever that guy is but you can't hear a fucking word Ray says here over the crowd absolutely livid with Scott mm-hmm. Steiner still. Um, but I think this segment made Ray look like a dork because he's clearly fumbling over his words, talking to Mark Madden. The mics aren't live and hot on the pay-per-view feed and it causes them all to pause awkwardly at one point. And on top of all that, they for some reason place Ray on the smallest chair of all time. So he looks about five inches tall. Yeah, he looks about the same height as Lisandro Martinez. Yeah. Hey. Um, high package then for the Kevin Nash versus Goldberg match. Um... Tony has a line during the entrances here. Years from now, we will all remember the man who beat Goldberg. And He's not wrong. For better or worse, that is absolutely yeah. true. Yes. Um, something here about this. Lex Luger being reduced to a valet sure is something, eh? <laughs> well, I don't know if you remember, but Lex Luger is not going away, Dave. So. <laughs> there goes, I don't even remember, but Lex Luger is not good in the ring, so I don't know why you're complaining. <laughs> well, there's also that, but I mean, Lex is about to probably the end of 99 go on his biggest run. Oh, I know. So, uh, oh, I so, remember. Yeah, you better get ready. Uh, so they try to no sell media interest in wrestling. Is it the New York Times they're talking about? Is it them uh, or TV one... guide? I think it's TV guide. Oh, talking about you know why is wrestling so hot? And they're like, please, it's always been hot. And in maybe Heenan's best line in weeks and weeks of commentary, he said it's because they don't allow run-ins in golf. <laughs> and it popped me. <laughs> it popped Tony. It popped today. Also, a direct shot of fucking what's his name, uh, Zabisco. Yeah. Um. Big uh, crowd noise for this. This is this is this feels like the main event of the pay per view. This could be big news. Um, I didn't realize this, but apparently the big breakfast is now a thing again on B- on uh, Channel Four. What? Yeah. Holy shit! I remember they brought it back for like a one off at one stage years yeah, no, ago. Apparently, apparently, it's on that weekend on Saturday mornings now. Jesus, uh, Man- what was the big breakfast to our non UK and Ireland viewers? Um, like morning talk show with. There would be like celebrity guests that would be on. It's on. Would be on from like half six in the morning till what like nine thirty ish. 
Um, yeah. It's kind of like, like a variety show. It's the, it, yeah, it save it serves the same entertainment purpose as um as a Good Morning America, but it's styled for a kind of like college age. Yeah, don't. Do you know what it'd be? It'd be like. You know, like how The Simpsons would have a lot of adult jokes, but they'd get mm. away with them because, you know, they're not yeah. outrightly saying what they're saying. Um, yeah. Very much like that kind of humour. Um, mm. But many, many's a wrestler would be on The Big Breakfast over the years. Um, I think Hulk Hogan very famously was on there. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, no, just, Jesus, I'm just on in the background and I just saw an ad for The Big Breakfast. Yokozuna was on the big breakfast, he was. wasn't he? On that tour before yeah. he died. Yeah. Poor Rodney. Fucking Yeesh. He was huge. Yeah. Um, so big crowd noise, like I said, uh, this is the main event to the people in the building, yeah. as far as they're concerned. Uh Nash says Wolfpack in the house. Um, something I really didn't like about this match, Lee. Uh Nash was on the offense for what felt like forever. Okay, so <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna differ on this one. Hello. Um I didn't mind Nash being on offense early and kind of being made to look dominant in that I knew Goldberg was winning. I think you knew Goldberg was winning as yeah. well. Um But it, like I don't mind that because like their Starcade match wasn't bad from what I remember. It was the no. finish that was awful. So Nash yeah. kind of beating up on Goldberg isn't unbelievable. Okay. No, but here is where I diverge from you in as much as, yes, in isolation, I don't have a problem with the heel beating up the baby face. But in terms of the quality of the two men involved, two things I do not sign up for are Kevin Nash on offense and calling the match and Goldberg selling. Yeah, well, that's that's probably fair. Now, look, it's a short match. Yes. It, well, it's eight minutes, like which is forever for a Goldberg match in some ways. It is, but he'd been going longer in main events. Yeah. Um Look, I, I didn't hate the match. I think you obviously had more problems with it than I did. Um, yeah. I think... There's there's one moment early on where Nash is setting up for his uh his sidewalk slam, and mm. Goldberg isn't quite sure of what's coming next because he kind of stumbles out of the corner. Yeah, and, and then they try yeah, to Nash run it back to send, and send him back to the other corner again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Goldberg then uh, to start off his uh, his comeback hits a shoulder tackle that somehow nearly kills both of them. <laughs> I mean, have you ever seen Goldberg on offense? Yeah. Yeah, he nearly decapitates Nash and lands on his own head within 0.5 seconds. Um, He throws Nash, uh, then he's ducking punches, scores a jab, scores a hook kick. He stalks for the spear. Uh, My favourite spot of the whole match is as he's going for the spear, Nash does a leapfrog and the ref eats shit, gets speared. I I feel Um, like that leapfrog was a direct shot at somebody, I just don't know who. (laughs) <laughs> you're just trying to piece you're going full Pepe Sylvia trying to figure oh, out oh yeah like who who was giving that shit that week saying yeah. he was unathletic un- um, so he decided to leapfrog a spear it's like when um, Orton did it despite the internet people yeah. and, and like he got too hyped up by being able to do it himself um, so Luger waffles Goldberg with a chair Nash is up and his straps are down uh, Goldberg grabs <laughs> uh, how would I put this Goldberg grabs his big sexy. <laughs> yeah, that's one way of saying it. Yeah, uh, gets up in his face. Lex, att- Lex attempts to sneak attack him from behind. And uh, the only way I can describe it is he gets kicked to bits. Uh, then he hits an almighty oh, spear, spear on Nash. Jack Hammer so in three. Good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, do you know what? Jack Hammering uh, Kevin Ash will never not be impressive. No. It was that's a that's a big and, boy. It's like when he does it on the and giant. you know what? That's the result the fans wanted. Yeah, Vindication. that that yeah that that uh, felt like look the the build to it wasn't perfect or anything, but it felt like a release for the fans after four, what four months yeah. of waiting to see could mm. Goldberg get at Nash. 
And and leaving the door open, Heenan does say it's one yeah. one. Um we then move into the main event of the evening. Special referee Randy Savage, Ric Flair versus Diamond Dallas Page versus Sting versus Hollywood Hogan for the WCW World Heavyweight title. The, uh, first things firstly. I was just going to say, do you know what the best part of the main event is? Uh, I know what it is. Would you like to tell people at home who wasn't not there? Michael Buffer. Yeah, I wrote, my first notes are no buffer, five stars. <laughs> Also, I have to ask your opinion on this. What did you think of Randy Savage's entrance? Huge pop for Randy. This is the debut of Gorgeous George as well. Gorgeous George toured, I believe. Yes. Who, it's quite a while during the entrance before it dawns on the commentators. That's who yes. it is. Um, and Bobby has, I like this Gorgeous George. Um, so big entrance, Randy's back, um, two things, Lee, one of which you know I'm going to say, uh, one, it's kind of a little bit disappointing to have Randy back after all this time, and he's just a guest referee in a match that doesn't really have much story going for it, let alone a reason why he should be involved, Mm -hmm. um, and number two, a big bugbear I have in professional wrestling is when there is a special guest referee who isn't in referee-adjacent attire. Randy Savage should never wear a referee shirt. No, I I agree with that, but there is significant leeway for Randy Savage to wear a very macho manified referee's shirt, and I think that was a huge miss opportunity. Okay, if 1996 Macho Man was going to be special referee, I know where you're going with it. Yes. I want the most ostentatious, rhinestoned um, referee shirt in creation for Austin's Randy. Everywhere. I Yeah, I don't want... He's just in his fucking gear, man. It's not even special well, gear. Well, it is special gear, because this was the debut of cool Randy Savage. <sighs> Yeah, look, it, what I mean is, like, it's not special for the match. It's for what he's going to be doing as, as a dude going yeah, forward. Yeah, but nobody but knew it's that. it's not like... Oh, I'm not having it, Lee. I'm not... I look, and I love Savage. You know that. And we've all we've always talked about his gear on this and about how he was, like, dressing like a million dollars no matter what the fuck he was doing. I was just a little disappointed because it's a thing I hate... And I thought there was an opportunity to have the most ridiculous referee outfit anyone had ever it seen. It is the most ridiculous outfit ref- anyone has ever seen. He not has macho written across I his chest. It, yes, but uh, I, not in the way I want. He can still have macho written across his chest and do the stripes. and do, uh, It's... Uh, no, I'm not having it, Lee. I'm not having it. I, I can't disagree anymore. I think he looks amazing. Uh. So No. Again... <laughs> He looks amazing, but not for the role he has in this match. He's mad. He looks he he is dressing in such a way that I'm like, why isn't this guy the world champion? These other four dudes look like fucking idiots compared to him. I'm not going to disagree with you there he, either. He he yeah, but like the referee, the guy who's the referee, shouldn't be outshining the <laughs> other four people in terms of main event. Look, it's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> Just make it a five way at that point. Yeah. Uh, listen, I I just think uh, to- uh, Savage looks incredible. I think he's the coolest looking referee I've seen in a long time. He referees the whole match while wearing his shades. That no, that part I love. Um, no number two thing that annoyed me. They essentially already did this four way yes, on um on Nitro this week or was it two but weeks ma- ago? Match on Man wasn't Except- ref. Macho Man wasn't the ref, and uh, you swapped Sting out for yeah. Goldberg. So, God bless Sting. I love Sting. You love Sting. We all love Sting. But that's a downgrade. Possibly. In terms of star power yeah. at this point. Um, Actually. Because they, and not because of Sting. It's because they fucked but it with Before Sting. we finish on, on Savage and get on to Sting, um, what, what's your opinion on Savage's new entrance music? I don't know. It's not fucking pomp and circumstance by any stretch. And I can't... 
if it's not gonna it's not it's not gonna be pomp and circumstance and it's not going to be be a man hulk then i don't want to know be fair, i i love i love his new music <laughs> i think it's phenomenal uh it's the only thing that's missing on it at the moment is the oh yeah or the, 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 the you know yeah. the intro of the what up match that gorgeous yeah. george does and then matros oh mm. yeah to start it all oh, um, i love it my final criticism which i think I, I i don't think you'll disagree with me on one bit is that champion out first horseshit yeah, bullshit. Um, I tweeted this out as I was watching it earlier this evening. I think I don't give out about it as much anymore because I don't think any company really consistently puts the champion out last apart from New Japan and AEW. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm kind of like beaten down to the point where I don't give out about it anymore. But whenever I go back in time when world champions still essentially were supposed to mean something at least. They had to completely kill this belt at this point. Um, so I can say with some confidence that it still meant something. And you have Ric Flair come out first. I just, I was so mad. Yeah, but they obviously, like, the two heels come out first. And I suppose if you can't be out first, or you can't be out last, you may as well be out first. So I, I get why they did it that way. And they wanted Sting to get the big return. Even though he has the most lackluster entrance of anyone, including the referee. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, DDP seems like he's been told to hurry up on the fucking entrance. He just starts sprinting halfway through it. Hogan out third. I hate the new NWO top. The, the red one. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the return of Sting signifies the return of the best theme song in WCW yes. history. The Sting Crow theme. Um, delighted to hear that, but also fuck them for not like turning down the lights and doing like the thunder and lightning effects to really go like start really... ninety seven with it. Yeah, so like you said, it's incredibly lackluster. Um, as for the match, it wasn't good. Lee, was it? it wasn't good. It was the plan was you two, meaning DDP and Sting get the fuck out of the ring. We're going to do a Hogan and Flair match that you guys occasionally interfere in. Yeah. And it It sucked. And there were two baby faces in this match. Mm -hmm. And if you hadn't watched a month of TV, I bet... You wouldn't, and even if you had, I'd say the the chances are low. But with a gun to your head, you'd be able to guess who the second one was, because like based on reactions, Sting was definitely a baby face. Who the fuck the second baby face was? Anyone's it's guess. Interesting, isn't it that Hogan had been getting strong face reactions, and then they go to the Pacific Northwest, which is not a a traditional WWF stronghold, yeah. and Hogan's not getting those same reactions. No. Um, so yeah, it's just a Hogan and Flair match for a lot of this, with occasional cuts outside. Uh, Hulk up as the others come back in. Deathlock gets locked in, but Sting has to stop it to break the pin because Hogan does the leg drop like a couple of minutes in on Flair. Uh, Hogan is then selling the knee. Uh, the other two go back outside because their bit for now is done. They have to get out of the way of the real main eventers. Uh, Flair sets up and locks in the figure four. Hogan reverses. The other two aren't fucked outside for ages. It's like they're not paying attention until their cue. Uh, Paige comes in, stomps Hogan. Uh, Flair... <laughs> oh, yeah, so DDP goes to hit Flair with a neck breaker, and Flair just decides he's yeah, not going to bump for it. He decides not to bump. And, like, DDP is clearly, like, thick about it and puts a little extra sauce on the clothesline to knock Flair out of the ring. Um... DDP does the Brett ring post figure four on Hogan. Uh, Flair then gets back on top of Hogan. I was just going to say, how bad is Hogan selling? Horrendously. Um, Because then you get the trainers and Doug Dillinger coming out to help Hogan back, who then disappears. Uh, Also, real life Um, Eric Bischoff. Real life, real man Eric Bischoff telling the cameras to go off. Um, And you can hear Hogan doing the, uh, I think it's broken, brother. I think he said, I heard it, I heard it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Bad. Um, Sting, the only discernible baby face, then fly- firing up on Flair. DDP is just sitting there waiting. Huge drop from Flair that f- uh, Sting no sells. I don't know how you don't at least wince because that mm-hmm. was a loud fucking chop. Uh, Flair does the flare flop over the top rope and DDP then jumps at his chance. Uh, Page fairly urgently on the assault, seeing his chance. Uh, near fall on Flair. Sting hits the big stinger splash as Flair watches on. Uh, in maybe the coolest move in the whole match, Sting tries his tombstone and DDP does like the cartwheel reversal uh, into his own tombstone for two. Um, Sting superplexes Flair, which looked like it sucked. Uh, I at this point I became drawn to seeing Gorgeous George on the outside trying to sell concern for the referee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, makes sense um, that the referee would have a manager at ringside. One of the one of the uh, savage highlights of the match was a point where there's a three man sleeper locked in with DDP Sting and Flair, and Macho is trying to do the ref bit at first, and then realizes like I don't know, so he just fucking shrugs. Um, Sting being double teamed, but he shakes it off and takes down both men. Uh, death lock on Flair, but DDP makes the break. Death drop on Page. Um. Something I really hated about, like, again, love Randy, love him to bits. Uh, but he keeps doing 10 counts on three men. <laughs> yeah, and also very fast. Very fast. And his pin counts are very slow, uh, which forms a point of discussion uh, amongst the uh, the commentary team. Where they're like, God, is his counts are very slow. Is he helping Flair? And then Tony has to jump in, or Ted and A has to jump in and go, uh, they're slow, but they've been consistently slow. So everybody has gotten used to the cadence yeah. of his pins. Um. So, yeah, I, like I'm just, the, doing the 10 counts on three men is one of those things. But I think if you're just a TV audience, you probably don't think about it. But if you're like us, you are, the longer you think about that and how it just shatters the rules of professional wrestling, the worse it gets. Um, Flair won't break. I I I did like this spot of the you know this is this is one of the 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 bonuses you get having a wrestler as a guest referee is that Flair refuses to break a figure four that's been in for ages. Um, Sting had been no selling it for a while, and then you know Flair keeps it locked in. Sting gets the ropes. He refuses to break. So Savage said, "Right, you won't break it. I'll break you." So he picks up Flair, drags him and the figure four to the center of the ring, and does the elbow. Huge pop. <laughs> Huge pop for the elbow. Um, guys are back up. Flair takes out Sting, turns around, diamond cutter, new champ. Um, just like that and uh, <laughs> in words that I couldn't agree with more Tony says a truly mind boggling ending to Spring Stampede <laughs> Lee I, I will cut to you for your takes on this whole match start to finish but um, I'm, I suppose in summary I would say bad match but also I'm super glad to see a guy we've championed since the start be the world champion yeah, it, it's unfortunate that the match was fucking awful. I don't know like where the thought went in that Flair Hogan being half of a four corners match would be in any way good, but they went with it anyway. Um, mm. Hogan trying to steal the limelight because he wasn't going to win by doing the injury angle is just typical Hogan. Um, yeah. I thought Sting, after being off TV for so long... Um, it has to be what seven eight months at that stage long um, long time the fans were so incredibly behind them at certain points in this match that they were like it felt like they were ready for another sting run on top mm-hmm. yeah. um flair i thought flair looked awful in the match in general i, I yeah flair flair looked yeah, what he really did um and considering he would go on to lose his confidence even further in this company, it doesn't say much for what we can expect from him going forward. <laughs> I was going to say, considering he went on to uh, wrestle up until a month or two ago. <laughs> um, and DDP, yeah, I'm happy for DDP, the man to be world champion. I am just so annoyed that they decided to make him world champion, what, three weeks after turning him heel. The circumstances are poor and the heel turn has been bad, but like in isolation... The guy has done whatever the company asked and 
gotten himself. And it's, it, really, it's an really elevation over. of somebody new, so I can't, I can't yes. fully knock it. Yeah, exactly. Um, Lee, uh, overall thoughts on the show: winners or losers? This is a show that has meant quite a lot to you. Do you think it held up on the whole, or where are you at? Can I call it a truly great pay per view? I can't. Can I say it has some of my favorite memories of watching WCW as a kid? I can. Um, it's a show I'll always have a fond spot for, but I couldn't say take the two what was it two two hours forty minutes the runtime is on the network two forty something like that. Six, um, I think. You know, cut out of your day to go watch a show. No, go watch. Go watch Raven, Saturn, Benoit Malenko. Go watch Blitzkrieg and Tubi. Go watch the Cruiserweight title match. Go watch mm. Goldberg and Nash if you have 10 minutes to spare. Um, yeah. After that, like we, we enjoyed Hacker and Bam Bam. I don't think everybody will. <laughs> um, yeah. There's really only, like, what? The, the main event... The main event has, a, a, I don't want to say a satisfying ending, but, it, you know, it's a, it has it, an it's ending. A new world champ, so, you know, it has that historical significance, so it's something mm. worth watching. Disco Conan and Mikey and Scotty Riggs are probably the only two insignificant matches. So it's a yeah. good show that could have been an all time show with a few minor changes. And I think maybe in hindsight, I feel like it gets a lot of people call it's not just us that call it the last great WCW pay per view, but I feel like maybe that moniker is given to it more as a reflection of what's to follow than what it itself yeah, followed. Exactly. Yeah, if you know yeah. what I mean. Um, it is good. I would very much hasten to call it mm. great. But the the stuff that hit really yeah. hit, uh, and the stuff that didn't is just uh, a harbinger of things to come. Um, j- just on your winners and losers. Um, again, I can't say enough about Raven and Saturn and Malenko and Benoit. Like that match, I I just think Raven and Saturn are just on such a an all time run that does not get talked about enough. Hmm. This is vindication for people like us who have maintained over the years. No, Perry Saturn was actually really fucking good. Um, and all certain people, even in yeah. our age group, remember is fucking yeah. moppy. It just, it's so sad. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, as has been publicly documented, he was his own mm-hmm. worst enemy at yep. times. Um, so like, you can't entirely lay the blame at what WCW and then WWF did or didn't do with him. But a uh, phenomenal talent. And again, Raven as well, a phenomenal talent who would go on to continue to be like, again, how many years after this was the like iconic match with Punk where he was still like being a significant uh, figure in wrestling, helping the next generation get over, you know, um, just a phenomenal mind for the business, even if he is by all accounts a very annoying man. Mm-hmm. Um. The finish counter, brought to you by Ludwig Borga. Nine matches, seven clean finishes, one interference leading directly to a finish, and one miscellaneous shenanigans. Um, Thank you all very much for listening to another episode of Days of Thunder. Uh, We'll be back next week on the Patreon feed, in two weeks on the public feed. And Lee, we've got an interesting month coming up ahead, because I don't know if you've been looking ahead on our planned episodes, uh, but on the free feed, we've got a couple of standard thunders, and then in in three thunders' time, we've got a simulcast podcast, as we are going to be talking about thunder going up against the pilot of WWF SmackDown. Oh, wow. I, I did not so that that's, coming so soon but yeah it makes sense yeah so that is coming up uh, this month in 1999 time in about a month and a half hour time so it's, it's something that's going to be very very interesting and uh, we'll try to put together a little bit of a special podcast reviewing both shows one, one of our that. rare ventures over to uh, the WWF 
indeed. Uh, right, anyway, thanks everyone for listening in. Um, Patreon.com slash WCW Thunderpod to get more of our lovely voices in your ear holes. Uh, we promise it will be well worth your few bucks uh, to be shelled out. Um, otherwise, we'll see you in two weeks on the free feed. Thank you very much. Stay safe and we'll talk to you very soon. Bye bye. Thanks everyone for listening to another episode of Days of Thunder. Days of Thunder was produced by Lee Malone and edited by me, Dave Ryan. To keep up to date with the show and find all the ways to listen to us, you can follow us on Twitter at WCW Thunderpod or click the Linktree link in our Twitter bio or in the show notes. I am at the Day to Dave on Twitter and Lee is at Malone underscore 713. Days of Thunder is a part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. Follow the VOW network anywhere good podcasts are sold for more fine podcasts than you can shake a stick at. Thanks.